The following contains discussions of sexual abuse. Listener discretion is advised. Diverse voices. Unique sound. Not the same old thing. Different. Different. This is NOCO FM. Welcome to Connecting a Better World, where we spend time meeting some of the most incredible human beings who make this world a better place. We will learn how each individual took their ideas, mission, and purpose to create and serve others in business and organizations that surround social good, social entrepreneurship, and social impact, and find out how we, together, can further connect others to help. I am your host, Dr. Natalie Phillips. Today, I will be talking with Jackie Bailey, founder and director of the Speak, Feed, Lead Project. Jackie shares her story as an abused child who lost her self-worth, self-confidence, and the ability to empower her voice. When Jackie discovered the lessons in her experience along with the meaning of her message to others, she was able to fully heal. She created the Speak, Feed, Lead project to be an advocate and provide a curriculum to mentor children in lifelong skills of confidence and communication and provide a piece of a larger societal safety net for the youth without family. The Speak, Feed, Lead project transforms all individuals to speak with power, feed others in word and deed, and lead with positive influence. have Jackie Bailey here. I'm so excited that you're here. I've learned a little bit about you. I'm so excited at what's coming up down the pipeline um, for you and for Speak, Feed, Lead. But before we even get there, I want you to introduce yourself to my listeners and tell me a little bit more about yourself, first of all. Like, what's your story? Oh, my story. It's a long one. I'm old. (laughs) Uh, My story. I grew up in an abusive home and when you are told not to tell, what it does is it really shuts you down. Mm-hmm. Because I, now I didn't realize this till years later, but as I look back on my life now, I realized that when I was told not to tell, I became more reserved and didn't initiate conversations with people because I was afraid I might tell something that I wasn't supposed to tell. And this was a chronic problem. And so as I was growing up, I pretty much kept that secret. I was very obedient and it didn't actually come out. I didn't start to reveal it until my abuser had a child. Oh, wow. So how old? I was married and I had two children by that point. Oh my goodness. And he had a child and I thought, okay, I can't keep this a secret any longer. I have to break the silence because another potential victim is in danger. So, well, and you don't have to go into the details, but like, how old were you when this happened to you? Um, Cause I'm trying to frame my mind around, you know, just imagining you as a child being told not to say anything about what was happening to you. So how old right. were you? I, th- I think it started around the time I was eight, but definitely by the time I was 10 um, through about age 14, by the time I was in 13, 14, I started to put a stop to it, essentially. (laughs) And did you have like brothers and sisters or did you have siblings that were around you? And even then, I mean, were were they abused as well? Or was it something that you literally had to keep to yourself? It was actually a sibling that was my abuser. Okay. And uh, so I had an older sister and then two older brothers. And then I have a twin brother. And then my parents divorced and my dad remarried and they had three more boys. So wow. I had six brothers and a sister. Wow. We didn't all live in the same house at the same time because my sister was 12 years older than me. So by the time I was eight or so, she was married and out of the house and that kind of thing. Um, and the little brothers didn't come until later. But um, yeah, so there were always a lot of people around and um but there was really nobody to tell. And because I was repressed to some degree, 
I wasn't sure even what was happening to me. It, it's, it's kind of a strange thing, but I, I always doubted that it actually happened. Right. And, and when you do that, then you become really ashamed because you think, well, if that was something that I dreamed, how horrible I am to dream something so ugly. So I must be a, a bad person. Wow. Dream that. So, so you start to protect yourself by thinking, you know, I can't tell anybody now because I'm a bad kid because no one would love me if they knew what I was thinking in my head. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so there. But, but like I said, by the time I was around 14, I started to realize this isn't, I'm not going to let this happen anymore. Good. And I started to sort of protect myself a little bit. It was still attempted, but I didn't let it happen after that. Wow. And um, so then I, so I got married when I was just a month out of the, uh, when I was just a month into 19. So um, I was really young when I got married. We had kids right away. And I said, and like I said, then this, this sibling of mine, this brother had, he got married and had a baby. And um, that was when I realized, oh no, I, I can't continue the silence any longer. Yeah. And um, that, was a, that was a really tough time for me. Yeah. What made you feel, and, and how did that work? Like you just said, at age 14, you just put a stop to it. Did it just stop? I, I know you said that it was attempted again, um, but you know, over time, did it sort of just fade away? Or was there always then this rift between um, you, know, you and this other sibling? Yeah. So what would happen is he would come into my room at night and eventually I started waking up before it went very far. And so I was able to just say, get out. Mm -hmm. And so as a teenager, I would just say, get out. And, and he would, cause you know, I would make noise if he didn't, <laughs> he didn't get out. So, so yeah, so that's, so he can continue to attempt it, but I didn't let it happen after, after Good. that point. Yeah. And so, gosh, and so you, looking back at, you know, when you got married and then you started to have your kids um, before uh, your sibling uh, had his own child, did you see, you know, the confidence rising in you? I mean, I don't want you to look back and say, oh my gosh, you know, this is my life and woe is me. But did you see that from that time on your confidence was it started to build or because you created this great organization and to bring out the confidence in people, you know, uh -huh. did you see that between age 14 and, you know, at 19 when you started, when you got married? Well, the only thing I can, I, I certainly did not have confidence. I was, I would never describe myself as a confident person from teenagehood on, even into marriage. But I always remembered thinking that, if I can live through this, I'm going to be a really strong person. I remember having that mindset from a very young age. And, uh, and yet, then when I was married and started realizing that I was going to have to let this cat out of the bag, so to speak, that was probably the worst time of my life because I had two young children. I hadn't been married very long. And now my marriage was at stake because I didn't know if my husband would even stay with me after he knew mm -hmm. what I'd really, you know, what I was really like. <laughs> uh, and, um, and yet at the same time, I had two children that I needed to protect. And if I didn't, if I, if I left this earth, which was something I'd contemplated at that point, if I left this earth and then there was no one who knew to watch for my children, then, you know, I, I was wrong there as well. So, it, it was a really tough situation and I remember just getting very angry and I started to just yell a lot at my kids because I was just in this, in a lot of pain. And I think that's when my husband started realizing there is something going on mm -hmm. here. There's mm -hmm. something wrong. And, um, and then when I finally told him why I was so angry and what I was going through for him, it was a relief because he was thinking it was all about him. He was thinking I had fallen out of love with him or something mm -hmm. and, and, and the marriage was threatened in that regard. But so when I told him what had actually happened and why I was so emotionally distraught at the time, at least he got it. He understood and was very supportive. Okay. And you then I just had to start breaking the silence to more family members. One at a time, I started with those I could trust the most or who I thought would believe me the most. Yeah. And I picked up on something that you said when you talked about, you know, um, 
kind of being a little afraid to share that with your husband because you said you're afraid of what he would um, come to terms, I guess, with who you, who you really were. Mm -hmm. So that kind of, um, you know, made me stop while you were talking because, you know, with you now working with youth and with, with people, children who have been abused, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Part of, part of them gaining their voice back is hopefully understanding that it wasn't their fault, right? And so what are some of the things, just because I picked up on that, uh, what you said, what are some of the things that come up in the conversations that you have with these children who have been abused? Because they probably say the same thing that you did, you know, like it's, you know, not necessarily it's my fault, but who I really am. And it's not really who you are. It's just something that happened to you, right? So what are some of the things that you might be saying to some of these kids as you're working with them about that particular image of themselves? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I don't, I don't pretend at all to be a counselor. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the children that I work with are, are students coming to me to learn public speaking skills, and they're learning leadership skills. The subject matter of abuse has not ever really come up because we're usually in a group setting and it's not something, because if they're like me, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have told anything in a group of kids because like I said, I, I'm not even sure how I would have described it. Mm -hmm. Um, But what, so what I'm doing is kind of coming through the back door and just helping these kids to feel confident in who they are and that they have a purpose. They have a story that the world needs to hear and that I'm going to help them discover that story and then find the tools they need to deliver it powerfully to the world. Mm -hmm. And everybody has that opportunity to deliver their message to the world at some point. So I know that some of my students are likely abused, but I, I don't come out and ask and we don't talk about it. Instead, I just want them to understand how much they're loved and I want to help them understand how to find that voice, which is something that I didn't find until much, much later in life. And I, I realize now that if I had had that confidence it would have changed everything. Mm, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the Speak Feed Lead Project. And how did you decide to start this then? And, you know, when did you start it? Well, I've been unofficially teaching public speaking for about 13 years. But it was about six years ago that I answered an ad for a homeschool group that wanted someone to come teach public speaking to their students. And I thought, well, that would be fun. I could do that. So I started working with this homeschool group and I was doing these nine week courses and develop, started developing this curriculum. Okay, what would I teach them now after they've learned this? What would be the next thing? And then I would go back a couple more units for that and then there was an elementary school near this community center where I was doing this and they decided to send some kids from their school after after school ended for them to the community center to take more classes with me and I started realizing you know what there's actually an opportunity here something is being presented to me and I need to seriously think about this so I started developing more and more classes on my own and I would rent space in this location or or use a conference room there. And I was driving all over the place to give these classes at different locations, Mm -hmm. eating three meals a day in the car. And then last summer, I happened upon a little 100 year old house that had been vacant for about a month. And it's eventually going to be torn down because it's in a very busy block in the middle of a city. And there's high rise buildings going up all around, but there's about these four little old houses that they haven't quite decided what to develop here yet. And so they allowed me to sign a year's lease because they don't have, didn't have any immediate plans. And so I renovated this little house and, it made, and I made it into a studio. So there's one large classroom, there's a smaller conference room, there's a little kitchen, bathroom, and then a small 
office that I, I would use for my computer and stuff. And so I started having the kids come to me for their classes after school. And we call it the Speak, Feed, Lead Public Speaking Studio. Wow. And the, the Speak, Feed, Lead was something that came by happenstance as well. I was teaching one of these groups of kids at some odd location. And I said something about how we, we learn specific things in our classes. And I said, we, we learn how to speak. We learn how to give feedback. And then we learn how to be leaders. Kind of like speak, feed, lead. Mm -hmm. And it was just this epiphany. Wait a second. <laughs> that sounded really cool. And that's how it became part of not only the curriculum, but the description of what we do and the name of the business <laughs> okay. at the same time. And did it become a nonprofit right away or? No, this... I was operating as a for-profit for about four years, four or five years until I opened up the studio. And then once the studio was opened, I realized that although my clientele was fabulous, they were kids coming from families who could afford these classes. And I started realizing, you know what, if I, if I, I couldn't have been one of those kids, I, my family would not have been able to afford mm -hmm. these classes for me. So what about all the kids like me? How can I reach them? And I know that there's lots of programs in public schools that would allow me to have access to some of those indigent children or, or those who needed extra help. But to be, to get into the non, to, excuse me, to get into public schools, you mm -hmm. have to be a nonprofit. So that oh. was the first impetus for me was if I want to get into the public school system and help with those, that demographic, that I need to be a nonprofit. Yeah. And then that started and it happened really fast because I found a great mentor and they talked me through all the steps and within a month of deciding I was a nonprofit. Wow. I mean, it, it happened really fast. And then, of course, the bigger vision starts coming, mm -hmm. like, oh, my gosh, we need to get to kids that are in prison. We need to get to kids that are in homeless camps or shelters. We need to get to those kids who have deep-seated social anxieties. We need to get those kids that have been trafficked or who mm -hmm. are abused, and maybe they're in the foster care system, and they're aging out of foster care, and they don't have any confidence and they don't know what to say or, or what their message is or how powerful what they have to say is. And so now we started thinking, oh my gosh, this is, this is bigger than we could even imagine. And then COVID hit and all of those opportunities to really reach out to those communities went kaput. And so now we're just biding our time until we can figure out how to really ramp this up and get, get into reaching more children. Okay, um, so it's still kind of in the new stages then uh, that yep. you became the nonprofit and now you're trying you're trying to get to the outreach stage where you can try to get some of these kids in then um, to be able to have this public speaking just uh, experience then. Yeah, I would love to be able to take a teacher mm -hmm. into a correctional facility, which by the way, in Washington State where I am, there are 13,000 kids admitted to correctional facilities every year. And many of them are as young as 10. Oh and a lot goodness. of them, about 20% of them, are admitted more than twice in the same year. And so these kids are going into these correctional facilities and they're learning how to be lifelong criminals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have no data that states that if kids have public speaking skills, that they're, they'll stay out of prison. However... <laughs> I know that if I had these skills when I was young, it would have changed my life. And so I think that there's just so much potential here to help these kids. They're, they're obviously making bad decisions for some reason. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because they don't feel that they have a voice. They don't feel like they can say what they, they need to say or what's happening to them or, or whatever. Many of these kids are coming from broken families or they're coming from parents who are abusing chemicals and other types of things. And so the kids really are lost. And without that voice, mm -hmm. they're going to continue to be lost. So that was that we really like to be able to do that. Yeah. Did you have any hesitation or any fears when you started this or turned it into the nonprofit? No, you know what? I'm, <laughs> I don't really think through things very well. <laughs> I just, I get an idea and I go, you know what, let's do this. Mm -hmm. And then I just, 
start working on it. And sometimes that's been a detriment. But no, times, I hear you. <laughs> other times I have discovered things that I can do that I never thought I could do. Yep. And so it's a good thing. So it, it, the nonprofit has really been a great thing. It's opened a lot more doors for us. And I can only imagine it's, it's going to open more and more. Yeah. What kind of support did you have or, or do you still need? I mean, what's your team like? You know, what kind of support did you get from your family? For the, for the nonprofit generally? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I immediately started thinking about who would be on my board. And because I have a radio show that I do every week, we've had some amazing guests on our radio show. People who I now know do a lot of things with kids or who have had in the past opportunities to help mm -hmm. kids. And so those are the people I turn to to be on my board. So I have Ani Anderson. She and her husband are business coaches, but they also practice Qigong. And they have, she's, Ani's written this book called Finding Your Soul's Agenda which helps an individual to walk through what their purpose is and what their soul desires for them to do. And I was amazed at how much kids needed that. And so I asked her to be on my board and she said yes. And then Patricia Caganello is, um, she owns a publishing company in Connecticut and she publishes spiritually minded mindfulness type of books. And so I thought, what a wonderful person to have on our board that eventually I'd like for my students to have a compil compilation of stories that we can put in a book wow. that we can let them have and sell and uh -huh. whatnot. And so I thought that would be a great thing is to have yeah. a book publisher right on my board that would allow us to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I asked my co my radio co-host, Todd Cutteback, who is a uh, former United States Marine, and he is a wonderful speaker, and he and I have led the same organizations, and he's a business owner and knows how a business needs to operate successfully. So I thought, there's someone I need to have as well that can help me through all those financial details that I'm not good at but that also has this inspiring message. He too wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And so those are my board members and very happy with, with them and what they offer mm -hmm. to us. And then I just recently hired our first instructor besides me. Now I'm a Yay! Yay! <laughs> So, and I think we'll probably have to hire a couple more teachers before fall classes begin. So mm. we're excited about that. When I saw that you have um, public speaking courses, both for children and adults. So, you know, how are these for parents or parental figures in that child's life that come along with the child? Or is it like separately for adults and separately for children? You know, how important is it to you for adults to also learn to speak, feed and lead? Well, it's interesting because this summer I had planned to do a parent-child combined class. Mm -hmm. We were going to do some typical summer camps, but then I was excited about putting together this idea of having maybe eight parents and their child come to a regular a weekly class and have fun activities growing the relationship between parent and child. And I was really yep. excited about that. Of course, COVID changed that idea. But I think a little bit of that might happen through the summit that we're putting on. But typically speaking, to answer your question, mm -hmm. the adult classes are usually separate. Okay. Most of my adult clients are those who are thinking about writing a book or they're starting a new business or they're going to podcast or blog or something like that. And they're looking for what is my message? Yeah. What is it that I had to say? When I boil it all down, what should my book be about? And if I'm starting a new business, what is the story that's going to be behind my business and why I'm doing this so mm -hmm. that, you know, I sound more interesting and, and uh, more compelling. Mm -hmm. And so that's my adult clients. We work through that. How do you find that story? We also do the same thing for students who are college bound. Many colleges today are requiring or highly encouraging a potential student to submit a personal essay or a personal video mm -hmm. in their college application papers. 
And a lot of these students are completely lost with what that means and how to do that. So again, we work through this process that helps them think about the experiences they've had. Well, what did you learn from those experiences? Okay, how can you take that experience now and share that as a message to somebody? This is what happened to me, this is what I learned from it, and now this is how I do things differently. And so that's a fabulous formula for a compelling message that at a college would love to hear from yeah. someone. Yeah, so, I love those applications. Yeah, so we work through a course and either they get their, by the time the, the course is over, they've got their essay written or they've got their video created and they're ready to submit their papers. And wow. all of the students that we've helped with that so far have gotten into the colleges they've wanted. So wow, that's wow, that's awesome. Uh, you know, as a mom, though, I am really interested and I can't wait for you to continue with the parent and child classes or, you know, because, you know, I have many pots in the fire as well as you probably do, right? And that's yep. why I giggled a little bit when you said, oh, I just kind of go with it. I'm like, yep, that would be me too. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so let's talk about you and your kids then, right? I mean, so what you're doing bleeds into when you get home. I mean, they see what you're doing. So do you have these conversations with them? And are you kind of, I mean, you can't help but probably teach and, and coach along the way because that's what you do. Um, but are you helping your kids along this process as they're growing up in their own confidence? Well, my kids are now adults. They are married <laughs> and I have four <laughs> grandchildren. <laughs> okay, your grandchildren or when, no, but even then you were doing this for a while. So yes. your offspring then, your children or your yes. grandchildren. Yeah. Yes. Do you slide so I, in some I different lessons? I do enjoy spending time with my grandchildren and helping them to craft stories mm -hmm. and helping them to learn new words. And uh, so I'm passing it along there. I'm hoping my, my oldest grandson, Sam, is now 11. So he's old enough to, to attend our summit coming up in a few weeks. So we'll look forward to seeing oh, him nice. there. But the others are still a little too young to take my classes officially. Yet. <laughs> we, start, we start with grades four, which are usually about 10 years old. Okay, so let's talk about this summit because I'm super excited about it. I get to be part of it. I was invited by a friend. You've got a huge lineup of people. I mean, it is, it is amazing. So I'm going to let you share the news, but let's talk about the summit that's coming up and what, you know, as an event to help spread awareness for your organization, what's going on with this? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we can't have summer camps, which we would normally be doing, and those camps would be focused on some element of communication. Speaking, debate, um, improvisation, things like that. We can't get together because of COVID. And I thought, how can we get together? And how can I put, to, how can I put a class all day long like we would have at summer camps? I can't, can't do that to the kids. But we could have a summit where they're not necessarily having a class, but where they could hear some really powerful speakers talk about their own stories. And I started thinking first about the wonderful speakers that I know. And I competed years ago in the World Championship of Public Speaking and mm -hmm. became uh, one of the 100 top speakers in the world. And so I know a lot of the actual champions and they, they were the first thought I had was, I need to get these champions wow. to the summit. And then I started realizing, but wait a second, these kids are really in trouble right now because COVID has rocked their world and they don't have the life experience yet to understand the perspective that this is going to be over soon and everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them are feeling this anxiety. I don't think they know how to really describe it, but they're a little bit off and they see their parents having this worry and concern and trying to interpret that the way that their brain can. And sometimes it's just completely wrong, the way that they think things are happening. So I started to realize, wait, if we're going to do this summit, then we need to broaden this focus. And it's not just going to be about how to speak better, right? It's going to be about how do you find who you are? How do you increase your self-value? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you communicate with other people in a meaningful way? What are some of the words you can find? How do you increase your emotional intelligence and what does that mean? And so uh, when we started looking for speakers, all these wonderful people started coming alive and, and contacting us and saying, I'd love to be a part of this. And yes, I have a, 
a youth focused message I'd love to give. And, and it's so amazing, Natalie, the, um, the diverse people that we have speaking at our summit. Our goal is 50 speakers. We're at 48. Right oh, now. wow. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> there's a lot of amazing topics, too. I, I yeah. created a post, I remember, and I was like, I'm not leaving anybody out because it is so exciting. And the topics are like, I'm going to be sitting there with my daughter as much as I can, you know, because it is during the week. So, you know, yeah. um, share about the speakers, share about, you know, when is it running, you know, the times, how people get involved to tune in and yeah. um, support Speak, Feed, Lead. Yeah, so we, we are the Speak, Feed, Lead Project, and you can find details about the summit specifically by going to summit.speakfeedlead.org, and you will see our wonderful lineup. It's going to be happening in two different sessions. So this will be five days a week each session from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon. At Pacific the top of standard time? Pacific time. And at the top of every hour, there'll be a new presenter. So seven presenters each day. And they, it won't just be that the kids are sitting there listening. A lot of these presenters will be engaging with the kids. They will be playing games with them. They will be asking them to say a few things or to show some things on the screen. So there will be lots of reasons to stay engaged and pay attention. And we hope that we can get 100 kids at each session. Because if we can change the lives of 100 kids, that means we're also helping 200 parents to have a reason to communicate with their kids about a topic that they heard that day. Yes. And we hope that's the byproduct of this, is that at dinner, at the end of each day, a family sits down together and talks about what the child learned and how that affected them and what they will do with that information. So um, it starts on August 3rd and we'll go, that first session is from August 3rd to August 7th, Monday through Friday. And then the second session with some of the same speakers, but mostly not, mm -hmm. will be August 10th through the 14th the following week. So for two weeks, nine to four, Pacific Standard Time, every yep. hour there's a new speaker, so seven speakers a day. Um, you can purchase tickets for each session separately, correct? Yep. yep. And then let's say a person purchases, purchases a ticket for the session but is not able to watch all of them. Is it going to be replayable for them? It will not be replayable. We are going to be recording it mm -hmm. and each presentation will be its own 40 minute presentation that we will give away as gifts or as special incentives for other opportunities. But the summit will not be replayed again. It is happening live. And if they can't see every, you know, here's the thing. I don't, I, I preach against having kids sit in front of their computer all day long, right? So, so this was a little bit counterintuitive for me at first to think mm -hmm. I'm, I'm offering this all day summit when I've been telling these kids, get off their devices. <laughs> but I also feel like this is so much more powerful and important mm -hmm. than a video game would be that I'm feeling okay with it now. Mm -hmm. But even if they can't see every presentation, I still want them to try to see as much as they can mm -hmm. and listen to it if they're out in their yard, kicking a soccer ball around, but they can still have the summit playing and they can listen to what's going on. I'm okay with that as well. I know a lot of my students are artists and so they enjoy doodling, you know, mm -hmm. while they're listening to things. I don't let them do it in class, but I know that they will do it on other occasions and I'm okay with that as well. But hopefully through osmosis, they're gonna retain some of the information mm -hmm. that they are at least hearing. And this is for, um children or kids age 10 through about 17, correct? Yep. And we want their parents there as well. So if, so a, ch a parent can purchase a ticket for a child to attend, but mm -hmm. the parent is free essentially. Okay. So we mm -hmm. want the parent to attend with the child as much as they can. Yeah. And I mean, take a look at the website summit.speakfeedlead, right? Dot org. Yep, is that correct? You got it. Okay, because um, you should see some of the people that are lined up to speak. I mean, these are people that probably speak 
corporately to, to other individuals, to adults. And, you know, they're making their message focused for the child, but the adult's going to learn as well. So I think it's very, very cool the way it's set up because these are people that I know are speakers out there, you know, that are speaking at different conferences or summits or, or things for more adults. But I do think that, you know, why have the separation? And if the message is clear, the message is going to reach both a child and an adult, you know, in different ways, obviously, because we're at different stages in our life. But if the message is clear enough, it's going to be helpful for both. Uh, so I, I really like how um, how you have it set up, and I think it's brilliant. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, do you have any projects or any stories that you've experienced that may have touched your heart, um, and you know, help you continue to give back in this way? Well, I'll tell you. I mentioned that I had competed in the World Championship of Public Speaking. And this was a big deal. I had gone through some leadership, a leadership tenure where I was ineligible to compete. But I always felt that one of these days, I wanted to be the world champion of public speaking. Because how many times do you have an opportunity to be a world champion at anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so when I was eligible to compete, I crafted a speech about my abusive life. And Although it wasn't about the abuse itself, it was about the process I worked through to be able to forgive and to move forward as I healed from the abuse. And as I gave, if I, as I gave the speech at that first level of competition, I won. And then I gave it the next level and I won and I kept winning. And that one that summer where I was practicing that speech because I'd made it to the semifinals. Okay, I was going to be the, the top 100 speakers out of 35,000. Wow. And I had to practice two different speeches because if I won the semifinal, I had to go to the final competition the next day and it had to be a completely different speech. So I had six weeks from the time I won. At the, at the district level to get to the international level. And I was practicing these two speeches. And many people were telling me, you know what, you can't, you can't give that speech at an international level because there's some countries that are going to be represented there where child, child abuse is just pretty much normal. It's, it's what they do. And this is not going to be well accepted. And then people would say, maybe if you just made it lighter, maybe if if you added some more humor to it. Oh my goodness. And so I struggled, I struggled with trying to rework it so that it was funnier, <laughs> you know? And on one of these occasions, I was, I went, I was practicing this everywhere. So I went to this one opportunity at Fred Hutchins Cancer Center. So it's a cancer hospital. And the nurses there invited me to come and practice the speech during their lunch hour or something. Mm -hmm. And so they made us this open house and I walked in this room and there were probably 50 people there. And I gave both of my speeches. And then after that happened, what we did is we allowed everybody in the room to give me feedback, to tell me what, what did they feel about my speech? What, what would I change? What should I change about it? Or how did I inspire them? So we went around this room and most people said, you know, positive things, the typical kinds of stuff. But there was this one young man who was in the corner of the room and he did not look like he belonged there. He did not look like a nurse. And he, he didn't appear to be a patient either. He was quite young, probably in his early 30s. He had um, a, a wife beater t-shirt on, you know, the tank top kind of t-shirt and shorts. And he was tattooed, lots of piercings in his ears and, and around his face. And when it got to him, as far as the, the feedback, he stood up and he said, you know what, I don't really have anything to say about your speech, but, you know, I'm an abuser. And this is the first time I recognize what my victims go through. Oh, my gosh. So I, he says, wow. I have some changing to do. Oh, and my And I went, goodness. oh, my gosh, this is why I'm giving this speech. This, oh my this is why, gosh. this is why, you know, if, if that's the only reason I'm doing this, then that's good enough because 
somebody's life may have changed that day, not just his, but whoever his victim is, maybe there it, things wow. were different for them going forward. So I, I learned that it was powerful, but I was, I was talked out of giving it. <laughs> so and it was about 10 days before I was supposed to leave for the competition, which was in Las Vegas. And I was practicing both of these speeches after having tried to make it lighter, you know? And the feedback that I got from people that I knew well that night was, I felt like I was publicly flogged. <laughs> that's what it, what it felt like to me. It was, that's not good enough. You know, your message not strong enough. Da, 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 da. And I just, I cried. I cried for a couple of days thinking, what am I going to do? I have this competition in 10 days and I've tried my best to make it work for everybody. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm not happy with it. And so I wrote an entirely different speech on the plane oh to Las Vegas. Now keep in mind, I had, I had given this speech probably a hundred times and I knew it inside and out. I knew exactly the movements I was going to make every time I said a particular word or whatever. And now on the plane, I'm writing a new speech, which will have never been given in front of an audience. Oh my and I'm going to be on an international stage. <laughs> so this was not a delightful experience at this point. And uh, that morning I showed up for, to meet the, the MC for the contest and to meet the nine other contestants that were in my semifinal. And I was the only woman in that semifinal. And I thought, well, if nothing else, at least I'm going to stand out mm -hmm. a little bit, right? Maybe I'll be memorable that way. And so I met these nine men. And after an hour of, of just doing some pre-contest work, I was, I was so amazed by them that I thought, it doesn't matter whether I win or lose or place or anything because I've just made some amazing friends and every one of these guys deserves to win. Wow. And so five hours later when the contest took place and I got up on that stage and I looked out at this audience of probably 2000 people. And in that moment, I just went, this is cool. This is cool. Look at where I am. Mm -hmm. These people are going to hear what I have to say. And even though it's not the message I really want to give, I'm going to just have fun with this. <laughs> and so I did. I had fun giving a speech that I'd never before given in front of an audience. And I didn't place, but, and it was disappointing, but at the same time, I realized that never, ever, ever again will I not be authentic. Yeah. Never, ever, ever again will I let people say, you shouldn't give your message. You should give a different message. I will never, ever let someone talk me into that again. And so that's one of the most important les lessons I've had in life. And that I want my students to know is that it is your message mm -hmm. and it is worth sharing to the world. And don't ever let someone tell you your message isn't important or strong enough because one person I know was changed by my message. Yeah. And that's, that's the best gift of all. Wow. That is awesome. I love that so much. I love that story. I mean, because it just goes to show you that you don't know where your impact is going to be. Just like what you said. Um, you know, man, I had chills during that whole story because it's, it's amazing, you know, and I think that it's such an important lesson to learn whether you're an adult, whether you're a child, you know, whether you're in between, whatever it is. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't stick to their story, not necessarily that they're ashamed, but they might think it's not important, you know? Right. And, and I think that everybody has a story to share. Um, and whether you use platforms like this, you know, with your radio show, with your organization, whatever it is, um, you know, encourage each other to get that story out there and to craft that story. So it's not just about, you know, getting your story out there because some people might sit back and think, I don't have a story, you know, right? right. But yep. it really is taking that time to look at your a unique person and you have something to say and if you don't come out with it, you never know what's out there, who's out there that's waiting for you to 
to, to share your message right. that you could change your life. So I absolutely love everything that you're doing. I love the speak, feed, lead a project um, that you're creating and, you know, I love learning about it. So, so thank you so much. Um, thank you know, you. Is, you know, for people who are listening and they want to help spread awareness, spread the word um, you know, about what you do, or maybe even get involved, what are some of the ways that they can help? Well, we are a nonprofit, which means we always like donations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we would like to not only have monetary donations, but school supplies, laptops. If we, if we can get into homeless shelters to teach our classes there, mm -hmm. we would like for the kids to be outfitted with all the things that they need, the tools that they need to be successful to be able to hear our classes. And so school supplies, laptops, those types of things we will take. We will also take automobiles that we can sell and get money from that. Right, we right. take real estate. If you know someone who's got a high burden, de debt burden or, mm -hmm. some, or a tax burden or something like that on a house or a property or, I mean, I know because of COVID, there's going to be a lot of empty office space right now, right? Right. We would love for you to donate it to the Speak Feed Lead Project. And then we have investors waiting to take that and, and do something with it. In fact, the, the little four houses I mentioned yeah. that are part of where I, I would really love for the landlord to donate, donate this land to us because I have this dream. I haven't thought through it like always, but here's my dream is to build a center mm -hmm. where we can have not only public speaking classes, but we could, have, we could use the STEAM and add an S to STEAMs for speaking. Oh, we I love that. We could have science, that. technology, engineering, arts, math, yes. and then speaking. It would be uh, full STEAMs ahead. Yes. And it would just be a oh gosh, center where we'd have, we'd have a theater. We would have a hydroponic garden on the roof. We would have art classes and we'd have math Olympiads. It would just be a huge center where we could just have youth programs mm -hmm. going all the time and really empower our kids with all of those skills that not only that they like, but they, they're important for them to be able yeah. to succeed. I love that idea. I cannot wait till you implement it because it's going to happen. <laughs> um, okay, so a couple of questions here. You know, not the automobiles or the um, rental properties or I guess the houses or anything like that, but do you have a list of your needs on your website? Um, like the school supplies, things like that. Or do yes. you have, um, can people connect like their Amazon smile account or do you have like a, yep. um, I know that some different schools and some different places even had a list that they can list on Amazon. So that way people can click that link and say, Oh, what do you need? Oh, I'll just purchase that for you since I'm on Amazon anyway. You know, do you have That's a great list? idea? Yeah. We, you need we, to look at that. On, we are on, we are on smile.amazon. So okay, you good. can choose the speak feed lead project to donate to as you are mm -hmm. purchasing your regular products. I never thought of creating a wish list yes, though on Amazon. Yes. That's a really cool idea. Yeah, and then share that <laughs> link out because it's something as simple as, oh, pencils. Yeah, okay, I'll add that to my cart. Yeah. And, and off it goes to you, you know, and it and it's something that's so easy. So I've seen that happen a lot. So that was the yeah. question that I had for you, especially for the supplies that you can get on Amazon. And if you link it to your smile.amazon account too, um, for people that are shopping anyway, you know, then it goes, you know, that percentage, I know it's a small amount, but every amount, yeah. you know, counts, Everything but helps. that will go back to the speak feed lead project. So that would be yeah. something that would be kind of cool. Yeah. Great idea. Let me put that on my list. Yes. Do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> oh, awesome. this is so awesome. Okay. So I always like to close my show to just asking you because you're a leader and I love what you're building. Um, you know, what might be one piece of advice that you can share with my listeners just on making the world a better place? One piece of advice I think is you need to understand what your purpose is. That can be found in your life's experiences. If you, if you think about what is your core value, okay? Do you believe honesty is the best policy, as they say? Do you, have you learned that determination allows you to succeed? Or do you find that being prepared in life has been your best tool? 
whatever that core value is, think about that and consider how did you learn that? How do you know it's true? There's got to be stories or experiences where you learned how to be prepared, that the time when you failed because you weren't prepared sealed your fate and now you recognize you need to do things differently. It's just to be a story as simple as that. And then when you know your story and you can say, this is the value that I hold dear and I know it because this mm -hmm. is the experience I had that taught me, that is the start of a message that will be motivating and inspiring. Yes. To audiences anywhere. So my advice to you is figure out what's your core value Figure out how you learned that's true, and that is the start of your motivational message, and then work on it. I love it. Thank you so much. I think everybody is going to benefit from this, and I'm so glad I got to spend some time with you. Thank you for your time as well, um, and just you know, learning about your organization and what you stand for, because I think moving ahead, this is going to grow. I see your vision. I, I, like I said, I cannot wait for it to come to fruition, because I think you're going to be able to do it. I love it. You're a champion, so thank you. Well, Natalie, and thank you so much for being part of my summit. I cannot wait to hear your message to the kids and I'm just thrilled to have met you and have had this opportunity to work with you and collaborate on this wonderful cause. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in to Connecting a Better World and thank you NOCO FM for supporting this show. If you haven't heard, NOCO FM is dedicated to bringing diverse voices and spotlighting a unique culture to Fort Collins and beyond. For more information, please visit www.noco.fm. If you connected to something in this episode, we would love to hear from you. Our contact info will be listed in the show notes, as well as you can reach us on our social media channels. Please feel free to share our podcast with your friends and loved ones. For more shows, please tune in to noco.fm online. This has been a production of NOCO FM.